Okay. So um, earlier I said I was looking through our past events and realizing what a strange organization we were. So I kind of thought in a way I kind of talk you through why we're so committed to what we do. Um, New Orleans Airlift began in the post, in 2007, we say we are founded. Um, as, as a funny aside, you know, we wouldn't actually get an official organization bank account for many years later. So we really did kind of grow organically out of an idea. And the idea originally was that artists and community members were coming back to New Orleans post Katrina and there just wasn't the audiences to sustain them. However, both myself and my co-director and co-founder, Jay Pennington, were spending a lot of time in other parts of the world where there was a lot of interest in New Orleans culture. And we thought, what if we could take some of these people to some of these places where everyone wants to know about them? And the first place we chose was Berlin. Um, so we were both artists. We'd never organized anything before in our lives, and we decided to take a bunch of people to Berlin. <laughs> the kind of people we wanted to take were the people that we were so worried that their culture was you know, being imperiled. Um, we, were, we were really drawn to New Orleans street culture. So this, for people who aren't from New Orleans, is part of a second line parade. Amazing parades. If you guys are here on Sunday, you should check one out. Um, we're also drawn to Mardi Gras Indians. These sort of elements of New Orleans culture that really make it sort of the last bastion of a living folk culture in a big city in America. And this was so important to us to try and find a way to sustain it. Um, this kind of hallucinatory experience of seeing a Mardi Gras Indian walk down the street, something you can't get anywhere else in the world. And equally, other parades in other communities in this city. What was going to happen to all of this stuff, all these strange people that you can't seem to find anywhere else that lived in New Orleans? And so um, this is a puppeteer group called Scary Toesies that I'm a big fan of. And so we sort of started looking at all these people, all these musicians and singers, puppeteers, or all these puppeteers in New Orleans and circus people, painters, and, and um, this is Bruce Davenport. He's an artist we found really early on, and we did end up bringing his work about marching bands to the show in Berlin. Um, the show in Berlin took a long time to organize, and by the time we actually got there, it was all a little bit messy. As I say, it was our first experience as artists trying to organize things, but we really wanted to bring elements of New Orleans culture to other places in the world, so we started small. We started with films, and um, before we even got to Berlin, we started just taking smaller things that we could, and we would show them. So this is a still from Glory at Sea, which was um, a film by Court 13, um, a piece of the Southern Wild fame that won an Academy Award this year. Um, but I'm going to go back to that side for a second. But so we eventually got to Berlin, and, and it was great, and it was messy, and it was a really big learning experience. Um, and that was like one of the things that we organized. And to get there, what we had to do was work with these artists who were not really familiar with this terrain, and we helped them write grants. And in the end, we got 25 people to Berlin. They slept on couches and floors, and you know there were no hotels. It wasn't what we originally envisioned, but it was OK. So that was one of the ways we were working. And then we started thinking about these other elements of New Orleans culture that we really wanted to push. And one of them was bounce culture. Um, if you're not familiar with bounce culture in New Orleans, it's our homegrown brand of hip hop. Um, and in particular, we were fascinated, once again, by our culture in our own city with Sissy Bounce. And Sissy Bounce is a, a, a gay, transgendered, queer, form of bounce music, but amazingly, it's not for a gay scene. It's, these artists are some of the most popular artists in New Orleans. Every club you go to in New Orleans, they're there. But they had never left the city other than to evacuate um, during the hurricane. I don't think that's me. I don't know. Um, <laughs> Anyway, Sorry. so they, they had never left the city, and we thought this was really important. Um, we started just by taking them to parties in Brooklyn where we had connections. Everything we've done has sort of grown out of these networks of who do we know and how can we expose people and how can we show people this, this culture. So, you know, we did it our way, but eventually we were able to take these artists to places like Miami Basel, where Big Frida, who's standing here besides my co-director, Jay Pennington, and what I think is an adorable picture that speaks a lot to kind of what we do. We're always creating these kind of mashups of culture and connections and collaborations. And, you know, I'm proud to say that Jay has done a lot of work to advance this community and now Big Frida um, not only has her own reality TV show, but uh, many of the other artists we worked with um, have been able to get around the world. Here's Frida on the cover of a French magazine. So this is a kind of weird way of working, right? We're not just... Um, 
creating events or art exhibitions, we're sort of finding ways to get people around the world. And I really admire, and I, last night at our talk, at the opening keynote address, there was a lot of talk about funding. And I kind of admire my co-director. I come from a granting world, but with him, he would, if he wanted to get a, mu a musician down from New York to collaborate with one of our artists, he would just book them a show that would pay for their trip. And that would allow us to work with them. And, and he still works that way in many ways, and we do too. Um, one of those examples is Diplo. Diplo is a big produ producer, um, works with Beyonce and all these people, and he came to New Orleans to work with us and Nikki to be. And out of that collaboration came a hit song, Express Yourself, which is now on MTV and a big hit. And we're really kind of proud of this angle of our work. Um, I think it's a little bit unusual. We just sort of celebrate artists and send them around and try and facilitate opportunities for them, but it's because we love what they are doing. Um, this is one of my favorite pictures. This is Katie Red. Katie Red was the first um, transvestite performer from the Gay Bounce community. And here she is at Paris Fashion Week with a big designer named Rick Owens. And I love this picture because it just is like bringing together these unusual casts of characters. And it's really become a hallmark of what we do. Um, so, but we're growing as an organization. We're figuring out what we're doing. One day we got a call to host a Siberian breakdancer. <laughs> Um, as for a residency that was going to be, you know, paid for by somebody else and we were going to host him. Well, this was an opportunity we couldn't pass up, so we did it. And we had a great time with um, For Win or Ivan Stepanov from Siberia, a breakdancer. Um, but, so we were experimenting with all these different forms, but, you know, this experience in Berlin had sort of burned me a little bit as an artist. We brought 25 people over there. It was messy, it was crazy, it was fun. But I'm an artist and I wanted something to be more cohesively beautiful. So I started to think about how I could create formats for participation where I could have a little bit more control. So I started this society called the New Orleans Tableau Vivant Society. And I thought that this Tableau Vivants are living pictures. And I thought that this would be a, a great opportunity to bring lots of people in. However, I'd never done a performance project. So I called my friend Rosie Cooper of the Barbican in London and now the Liverpool Biennial and had her come over. And her approach was actually to then farm this project out to artists in England. And we created tableaus, created in, or designed in England with our performers in New Orleans who also created some of their own tableaus. And we presented this first one on the back of a truck that drove around the city with more or less success. Um, this is a great one. I love it. You know, some of ours were really fanciful, but this one was from a British artist. It's called The Waiting Room. And they literally just sat on a truck. <laughs> waiting for about five minutes. It was pretty great. And it was kind of about confounding expectations, being present um, out in the world with what we were doing. Um, there was also fire. Um, so I, I threw in this slide, this is at Parse, where y'all are going to be later tonight, hopefully, for the party. And this tableau thing really kind of caught fire in my mind in this way that maybe you could get other people to participate, because all you really do is stand still. So we did a night of participatory tableau in um, Parse Gallery, which is located right off Canal Street, allowing us to have tourists in our tableau, tattoo artists in our tableau. It was a great night, random people walking down the street. Um, this is a group of New Orleans artists that I love to work with, very creative. Um, and then, so, so these were some of the projects we were doing in New Orleans, and we started doing collaborations down here because the city was turning around and we wanted to bring people here for projects, but we continued to send things away. And so recently we went to Detroit with a group of New Orleans artists. This is their in-process installation. Um, but we also, we had artists, but we wanted to do the tableau and we did them with, entirely with the community members. So um, this is in Zynga. She worked at a gallery across the street and we were actually going to recreate some of the, these kind of beautiful uh, kind of black power sculptures, I guess, or mythical sculptures um, with, with black characters in them. So she was winter. Um, we worked with a bunch of kids. This is uh, setting up a tableau that we were rehearsing. And I like this picture because I don't know if you can see all our collaborators here, but I'll read them. We collaborated with Happy to be Nappy Hair Salon, Magic Touch Dance Company, 15 Children, a professional, amazing hip-hop dance company, Joe's Gallery, where Enzinger was from. All our outfits were provided by Teaser's Boutique. Um, the Eastside Bicycle Riders Club was there. And then the best of all was Echo of Silence, this teenage death metal band who played the music for the event. Um, here are some of the kids. They did a dance routine first. They were amazing. Um, and then we did these tableaus, and this was the project where I really kind of realized that part of this is really this transformative experience and how you can bring a community in and allow them to step out of their normal realms and boundaries and um, transform and feel the power of art and be in it. So 
Here are some pictures from our tableau. They were doing the seasons, and it was amazingly fun. Um, now I'm going to quickly switch gears, because all this has been going on, but <laughs> we've also had this really long-running project, and we are actually running on reserve battery power. I'm going to let somebody know. Um, and I'm just going to play you a movie rather than going into this project and see how much time I have left. I'm working on this project with New Orleans Airlift. We're working to create a building which functions as a house, but which also functions as musical architecture. We're all looking at it as this opportunity to make all the stuff that we think about all the time that's in our heads. Music box is really like a proof of concept. What does it mean, musical architecture? What could it be? I know it's gonna be nice because they're putting their heart and soul into it. These are my, my neighbors, my friends, and they got my support. None of us could have predicted what happened. We embraced this idea, and then the city just embraced it right back. We're dreaming big. We want to make a landmark in New Orleans, a place for everybody. So it started with this little house that was falling down that my co-director acquired. I'm going to fly through these slides. I don't want to hold up people. Um, it was a mess. We tried to save the facade. It eventually came down, and that was when we got the impulse to rebuild something there. Um, 
it took a minute to get to the idea of musical architecture and a musical house. But in essence, we'd invited Spoon down and a group of core artists um, kind of came up with this idea. And it was a great way to highlight a group of artists working in New Orleans that I was really a big fan of, which are these kind of inventors and tinkers. And so I thought a musical house, great way to bring this community in, a community that's not you know, overly known about, nor is the avant-garde music scene of New Orleans. So we started um, with a big fence and we started building behind it and there were so many there's 25 artists everybody was paid on this project I'm really proud to say not everything that he deserved but um, you know we had 15,000 visitors over the course of about six months tons of student workshops and what was amazing was the phenomenal caliber of musicians who wanted to work with us um, so these are some of our artists and a lot of them were from New Orleans a lot of them were from out of town there was a lot of collaboration sound artists visual artists coming together a lot of hard work and then it was built and it was really, really beautiful. And I think kind of in a way I said earlier, like that messy experience in Berlin, I never wanted to do that again. Well, this was the exact opposite. It was like 25 people all coming together to create this unified artwork. And so we had all these little musical houses and they were super beautiful. Um, and then it was time to invite the people in and that's when our city was brought to life and that was definitely the import of the project that you couldn't have this be a real artwork until it's sort of interactive instruments were, were triggered by our community. So, you know, little people, big people, all kinds of people came and the joy of these kind of cacophonous afternoons of people exploring and experimenting was amazing. Tons of students, as I said, students, um, and then the musicians were, you know, we, I think we're going to talk about cross-generational stuff later in this conversation. Um, this is Dickie Landry. He's a 71-year-old musician from Lafayette, um, Louisiana. He was the early Philip Glass collaborator and um, an amazing guy. But he was in the same performance with Nolafam, young local rappers. Um, as, you know, Andrew W.K., another performer, Theris Valdery, a flag boy for the Black Feathers tribe. What we would do with these performances is stack them so that all these amazing musicians were working together and meeting each other and having these phenomenal kind of exchanges. Um, and then we'd give these concerts. So these lines would line up around the block. It was amazing to see that happen and micro economies were forming. Neighbors were selling barbecue off of their front porches. It was pretty great. Um, and then what I loved about the performances, and I love about this picture, is you can see the kids from the neighborhood. You can see this kind of nicer lady. There were kids with face tattoos. It really was a place that everybody kind of came together for these avant-garde musical performances. Amazed us. Um, and we got to work with these phenomenal people. Um, the Bywater Boys, they were with us from the day we started building, experimenting, helping us <laughs> with um, whatever we needed. They were always around. They came every day after school, and then the spring season, we did a performance with them. They all got paid. They worked with professional musicians, um, a punk band from New York called Japanther, some other local artists. We shot that Nikki to Be video. But really, it was this kind of um, the community coming together in this space that sort of blew our minds and um, the connections that were made between someone like but from the Black Feathers Tribe and Jim White, who's normally a really sourpuss musician from Australia. Um, but look at him smiling there. And so we started to kind of, <clears throat> the music box is always a prototype for this larger musical house idea. You saw a model of it earlier. But you know, as we did this project and the sheer drive amount of people and the way it was embraced, we realized we had to dream something bigger. In the meantime, we were asked to go to Kiev, Ukraine, where we made a musical house and realized that this idea, you know, a musical house, it's, it could be any idea, but it's just that it's something about wonder and possibility that people can engage in. And, and it worked in Kiev too. And we've come back now and we've been looking at new sites because we can't be on our little block anymore. It was just too much. <laughs> and we've been talking to people in some new neighborhoods, particularly the Lower Ninth Ward. And I think we'll get into this as well, but moving neighborhoods is a tricky operation, you know? Um, so we've been making friends, making alliances. I saw on your handout that House of Feathers, this is Ronald Lewis and the Laura Nine Ford. I definitely recommend you go visit with him. Um, in January, we came back together with um, our artists and our musicians and we started remodeling. And now we have this absolutely fantastical idea <laughs> that is huge and we're gonna get there slowly by building one musical house at a time. Um, this is a model for what we think we could maybe build one day. Um, we're starting with building little houses and our new strategy to make this um, even more of a community endeavor is that we are pairing our artists now with unique community organizations. I'm gonna stop in two minutes. Um, 
just to highlight a couple, we're working with some of the greatest master craftsmen in New Orleans, the master blacksmiths, master plasters. We formed a partnership with this organization called the New Orleans Guild of Master Craftsmen and Swoon, for example, who was just down here meeting with them for the first time, and they're going to work on a house together. And what this means for our project is not that, just that their skills are there, but this whole new community is now involved, and the narrative of, of these generations of craftsmen who have inspired our project, which was inspired by architecture and music, of course, of New Orleans. So we're just delighted to move forward with this project. We plan to keep all the other stuff going, too. And that is kind of what we're about. So thank you. Thanks. Thank you.